finally. <laughs> uh, good evening, and thank you, Madam President, for allowing me to the opportunity to speak before this venerable institution. I'm particularly pleased, on a personal note, because I knew one Christopher Hitchens as a colleague and friend, and I, knew, I know that Christopher once stood here. He's no longer with us, but he, had, uh, he was a man of many talents, and uh, one major error in judgment, but he was a terrific debater. And I know Christopher Hitchens, and alas, I know I am not Hitchens. <laughs> but I will do my best. Uh, there is no more pressing issue before humanity today than the fate of nuclear weapons. This question before the House today, well, in my opinion, it is a question only madmen would consider. I quote a philosopher, we in America are living among madmen. Madmen govern our affairs in the name of order and security. The chief madmen claim the title of general, senator, scientist, administrator, secretary of state, even president. These madmen have a comet by the tail, but they think to prove their sanity by treating it as if it were a child's skyrocket. The madmen are planning the end of the world what they call continued progress in atomic warfare means universal extermination. And what they call national security is organized suicide. There is only one duty for the moment, stop the atomic bomb, stop making the bomb, cancel every plan for the bomb's use, for these clever plans are based on stark madness. There you have it, the case for abolition, made by the late American social philosopher Lewis Mumford in 1946, writing in the Saturday Review of Literature, a once popular magazine of the day. These words may now sound quaint, but only because after 78 years of living with the atomic bomb, we have become complacent. Indeed, we have fallen asleep, resting our heads gently on atomic pillows dreaming that they will deter our enemies. Now, I <clears throat> before I go on, I want to concede to the proponents that I think they have found one good use for atomic weapons. That meteor that you were mentioning. There you go. <laughs> Maybe we should save one atomic bomb for that meteor. <laughs> Otherwise, it's madness. Deterrence. That is indeed the only rationale for resolving that we are indeed prepared to push the red button. The argument is that only by appearing to be willing to gamble with Armageddon can we possibly avoid Armageddon. Maybe this crazy logic could hold sway for a few years at the height of the Cold War. But knowing humanity, it no longer appears credible. Indeed, madmen are in charge. Vladimir Putin's not so veiled threats to deploy tactical nuclear weapons in the Ukraine is evidence that the logic of deterrence is dead. Just think about it. If Putin's armies are suddenly facing defeat in the Ukraine, if the Ukrainians were to overrun tomorrow Crimea, would Putin be tempted to terrorize Kiev by launching a tactical weapon? I think the answer is very likely yes. And those among us who count ourselves as sane must argue that our response cannot be to escalate with a tactical nuke and kind. The problem here is complacency. We tell ourselves that these weapons have not been used since Hiroshima and Nagasaki and that therefore deterrence has worked. So much time has passed, we have lived with the bomb for so many decades that all of humanity seems to have forgotten what happened on the ground in Hiroshima. Robert Oppenheimer gave us the atomic age. Early in the spring of 1945, before the Trinity test of the gadget, scores of his scientists gathered to discuss why the hell they were still working so hard to finish the gadget when everyone could see that Nazi Germany was defeated. The Germans had lost the race to build a bomb, and the Japanese were not even in the race. 
So why give the world this genocidal weapon? Oppenheimer let them argue amongst themselves, and then he stepped forward and reminded everyone that on the last day of 1943, when Niels Bohr, the great Danish physicist, stepped off an airplane in Los Alamos, his only question was, Robert, is it big enough? Big enough to end all war. Oppie argued that the world needed to understand what a terrible weapon this was, and that they would not understand unless it was demonstrated in this war. Otherwise, the next war would be fought by two adversaries, each of whom would be armed with atomic weapons. Oppie's clever argument carried the day. His scientists went back to work. The gadget was tested at Trinity, and then two bombs were used on two Japanese cities. And Oppie plunged into a deep, self-inflicted depression. But within three months, he was going around the country making speeches, trying to warn the common citizen about the nature of these weapons and trying to make the politicians understand that the atomic bomb had to be banned. He argued for the creation of an international atomic authority that would have sovereign rights to go anywhere and inspect any factory and any laboratory so as to ensure that atomic weapons were not being built. He said at, <clears throat> in 1945, just three months after Hiroshima, quote, we have made a thing, a most terrible weapon that has altered abruptly and profoundly the nature of the world. He went on to call it an evil thing. Atomic weapons, he said, can be cheap. Atomic armament will not break the back of the economic back of any people that want it. So North Korea, Pakistan, India, Israel, and tomorrow Iran. He was prophetic. He knew what was going to happen. In an extraordinary admission, he went on to say that the Hiroshima bomb was used, quote, against an essentially defeated enemy. It is a weapon for aggressors, and the elements of surprise and terror are intrinsic to it, as are the fissionable nuclei. He tried to warn the President of the United States, Harry Truman, against relying on this weapon as something that could defend America from the Soviet Union. He tried to warn against getting into an arms race. He bitterly complained to former Vice President Henry Wallace that Secretary of State Jimmy Burns, quote, felt that we could use the bomb as a pistol to get what we wanted in international diplomacy, a diplomatic weapon against the Russians. He told Wallace that the Russians have, quote, good physicists and abundant resources. They may have to lower their standard of living to do it, but they will put everything they have got into building plenty of atomic bombs as soon as possible. One week later, Oppie was ushered into the Oval Office where he attempted to make the case for international controls. Truman interrupted him and suggested that the Russians would, quote, never get the bomb. At that moment, Oppenheimer understood that the President of the United States was a fool. And in utter frustration, he said exactly the wrong thing. Mr. President, I feel I have blood on my hands. Of course, the meeting ended abruptly, and Truman allegedly told Ney that he never again wanted to see that, quote, crybaby scientist. Oppenheimer's advice would be ignored. Truman and Eisenhower would build the hydrogen bomb and hundreds and then thousands of bombs. They called it a cheap defense. They were, by any definition, quite madly in love with the atomic bomb. We survived the Cold War barely. My late co-author, Martin J. Sherwin, entitled his last book, Gambling with Armageddon. It is a brilliant book, the best book about the Cuban Missile Crisis, which has been referenced here several times of 1962, and he demonstrates that we avoided a nuclear exchange in that instance only by sheer luck. And he's, he tells the story of a Russian submarine armed with a nuclear-tipped torpedo that was under attack by American warships and planes, and the captain of this Russian submarine ordered the release of the the nuclear-tipped torpedo. 
aimed at a, a U.S. frigate. It, it didn't happen only because by sheer chance, a Communist Party apparatchik that ranked higher than the, the submarine captain countermanded the order and said, this is insanity. Just sheer luck. Sure. Yeah, but it's sheer luck that the, the Russian captain was countermanded and sheer luck that that apparatchik was smart enough and happened to be on the submarine. Okay, sure. <laughs> Seven decades in the scheme of things is a very short time. And in the scheme of things, looking at humanity, looking at the awful things that we can do by accident and by willful deed, I'm certain that these weapons, if they exist a thousand years from now, they would have been used, not once, but multiple times. And we are on the verge of wiping ourselves out. We are facing Armageddon. 70 years is nothing, and we've just been damn lucky. Uh, <clears throat> no, my friends, we must not deceive ourselves with the logic of deterrence. It will inevitably fail someday. Human beings are frail, they make mistakes, and many of our generals and tyrants and even elected leaders are quite capable of acting irrationally. We cannot rely on these weapons. The atomic age, we must do as, as the father of the atomic age warned us 78 years ago. We must abolish these weapons and create an international inspection regime monitored by scientists dedicated to nuclear abolition. Oppenheimer did not regret what he did at Los Alamos. He understood that you cannot stop curious human beings from discovering the physical world around them. One cannot stop the scientific quest, nor can one uninvent the atomic bomb. But he always believed that human beings could learn to regulate these technologies and integrate them into a sustainable and humane civilization. We can only hope he was right. Thank you.